Today on The Daily Dose, Eli Whitney invents the cotton gin. After graduating from Yale in 1792, Eli Whitney ventured into the Deep South with plans of becoming a private tutor. Instead, he accepted an invitation from plantation owner Catherine Green, the widow of Revolutionary War General Nathaniel Green, to live on her Savannah plantation known as Mulberry Grove. Whitney soon learned about the primary difficulty in harvesting cotton, which was the separation of seeds from cotton fibers, limiting a slave's output of cleaned short staple cotton to one pound a day. Once Green and plantation manager Phineas Miller had explained the problem to Whitney, the young inventor built a machine that could efficiently remove the seeds from cotton plants. His invention became known as the cotton gin, the later word a shortening of the word engine, which worked like a strainer or sieve, whereby cotton was run through a wooden drum embedded with a series of hooks that caught the fibers and dragged them through a mesh. The mesh was too fine to let the seeds through, but the hooks pulled the cotton fibers through with incredible ease. Smaller cotton gins were hand cranked while larger ones were powered by horses and later steam engines and electricity. Whitney's hand crank machine alone could remove the seeds from 50 pounds of cotton in a single day, which in turn boosted cotton production in the South, making the commodity the leading American export by the mid 19th century. Whitney received a patent for his invention in 1794, prompting Whitney and Miller to form a cotton gin manufacturing company. The two entrepreneurs planned to build cotton gins and install them on plantations throughout the South, taking as payment a portion of all the cotton produced by each plantation. While farmers were ecstatic over the idea of boosting their output so dramatically, they had no intention of sharing a significant percentage of their profits with Whitney and Miller. Instead, plantation owners simply pirated Whitney's design, creating multiple iterations and improvements over Whitney's original machines, which in turn meant little growth or profit for Whitney and Miller's company. Although the cotton gin made cotton processing less labor intensive, the increase in profits from the cotton gin's efficiency prompted plantation owners to grow larger crops, which ultimately triggered an increase in slave labor and ownership, further dividing and accelerating a nation towards the American Civil War. Imperialism and the Slaveholding South Following the end of the Mexican-American War in February of 1848, Mexico's defeat handed much of the west coast of North America to the United States, prompting slaveholding factions within the antebellum South to dream of spreading slavery across the continent and beyond. A year later, after the discovery of gold in California, slaveholding Southerners began moving to the territory in large numbers, bringing with them an estimated 500 to 1,500 African-American slaves to work the gold fields of the High Sierras and beyond, prompting pro-slavery expansionists like Henry Weiss to wager that his home state of Virginia would make a billion dollars on the sale of slaves into the territory, which was hastily made a free state on September 9, 1850. Weiss's prediction proved patently wrong when Southern slaveholders discovered a second form of slavery in the American West including Native American captives and indebted mestizo peasants, which enslaved thousands into multiple forms of bondage or peonage in the newly acquired territories of Utah, Arizona, California, and New Mexico, employing systems of forced labor far less costly than plantation agriculture and chattel slavery. Still holding immense political sway in Washington during the years leading up to secession and war, Every time Whig or Republican abolitionists attempted to outlaw peonage in the American West, Southern legislators pushed back against every attempt in the 1850s, knowing full well that any law against peonage out West would eventually point a finger at their own form of slavery in the South. Despite growing abolitionist sentiment 
within the northern states, Southerners held fast to their expansionist visions for the American West, supported in large part by the formidable spread of Euro-American imperialism abroad, which relied heavily on indigenous coercive labor, from the British in India to the Dutch and French in Southeast Asia, prompting slaveholding Southerners to question why slavery couldn't be a part of white imperialism. With the hope of expanding their cotton markets into China, Southern legislators argued in Congress to a Southern route for the Transcontinental Railroad, pointing to a terminus in port cities in Southern California to build up their Pacific trade. Yet when Abraham Lincoln took office on March the 4th, 1861, Southern dreams for slavery in America collapsed in the face of untenable bloodshed during the American Civil War. Nat Turner's Rebellion Born in 1800 on the Southampton, Virginia plantation of Benjamin Turner, in a county where the number of slaves outnumbered white people, enslaved African-American Nat Turner was allowed to be instructed in reading, writing, and Christianity from an early age, where he was quickly assessed at having natural intelligence and a quickness of apprehension. As he grew older, Turner became a deeply religious man, often seen fasting, praying, and studying the Bible. Sold three times during his childhood, by the age of 20, Turner had become a local firebrand preacher and standout leader of his fellow slaves, claiming to have visions which he interpreted as direct messages from God. At age 21, he escaped from his current owner Samuel Turner, returning a month later after becoming delirious with hunger, at the same time claiming that a second commandment from God had instructed him to return to the service of my earthly master. By age 30, Turner was convinced that he was chosen by God to lead his fellow slaves out of bondage. And after an eclipse of the sun convinced him that the time was now, he first enlisted four other slaves to conduct a violent insurrection until they were forced to abort their attempt for a second try on August 21, 1831. This time, Turner and six others killed the slave-owning Travis family securing arms and horses before enlisting 75 additional slaves into a bloody insurrection that resulted in the murder of an estimated 55 to 65 white people. After the two-day killing spree was put down at Belmont Plantation, Turner managed to evade authorities for six weeks, during which time militias and angry white mobs killed an estimated 160 slaves. After his capture, Turner was tried and hanged at Jerusalem, Virginia, along with 16 of his followers. The bloody rebellion evoked swift action from state legislators, who passed strict laws prohibiting education to free and enslave blacks alike, while requiring white ministers to be present at all black worship services held in this state. Turner's rebellion put such fear in the hearts of Virginians that it effectively extinguished any and all organized emancipation groups in the region, further deepening the divide between slaveholders and abolitionists until the issue came to a head with the onset of civil war. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 Beginning as early as 1643, fugitive slave laws began dotting colonial law books, including a 1705 law in New York designed to prevent runaway slaves from escaping to freedom in Canada, while Maryland and Virginia passed laws that offered bounties for the capture and safe return of runaway slaves. Yet by the start of the Constitutional Convention of 1787, most northern states had abolished slavery entirely, obliging southern politicians attending the convention to insist on a fugitive slave clause to the U.S. Constitution, under the fear that free states would become a constitutional safe haven for runaway slaves. As abolitionist sentiment continued to rise in northern states throughout the late 1780s and early 1790s, 
many Northern anti-slavery activists began to petition Congress for an outright ban on slavery in North America, leading Southern legislators to demand passage of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793. While much of the Fugitive Slave Clause to the Constitution could be found in the new Fugitive Slave Act, the later document decreed that slave owners or their agents had the right to search for their missing human property within free states, while imposing a $500 penalty on any person caught harboring or concealing a runaway slave. After its passage, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 received immediate pushback from northern anti-slavery factions, insisting that the act turn free states into legalized stocking grounds for bounty hunters, at the same time exposing legally freed blacks to the possibility of being kidnapped and forced into slavery against their new rights as free men. In response, anti-slavery supporters organized clandestine resistance groups and built networks of safe houses that evolved into the Underground Railroad, while most Northern lawmakers intentionally refused to enforce the decrees of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793. Several states even went so far as to pass personal liberty laws, which gave accused runaway slaves the right to a jury trial, making the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 a temporary band-aid on the escalating crisis of slavery in America. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 Beginning as early as 1643, fugitive slave laws began dotting colonial law books, including a 1705 law in New York designed to prevent runaway slaves from escaping to freedom in Canada, while Maryland and Virginia passed laws that offered bounties for the capture and safe return of runaway slaves. Yet by the start of the Constitutional Convention of 1787, most northern states had abolished slavery entirely, obliging southern politicians attending the convention to insist on a fugitive slave clause to the U.S. Constitution under the fear that free states would become a constitutional safe haven for runaway slaves. After the Fugitive Slave Clause was replaced and bolstered by the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, which gave bounty hunters the right to apprehend runaway slaves in free states, plus imposed a $500 fine upon anyone harboring and abetting a fugitive slave. As part of Henry Clay's now infamous Compromise of 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act of that same year was one of several bills intended to silence rising calls from Southern legislators to secede from the United States. The new law compelled Americans to actively assist in the capture and safe return of runaways, while denying contested runaway slaves the right to a jury trial at the same time increasing the penalty for harboring and abetting a fugitive slave from $500, as set by the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, to $1,000, plus an additional penalty of six months in jail. Much like its earlier predecessor, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 faced instant criticism and pushback by a growing legion of anti-slavery activists leading states like Vermont and Wisconsin to pass laws intended to nullify the federal mandate, at the same time doubling down on assisting runaway slaves, which saw activity in the Underground Railroad reach its peak years during the 1850s. Given such high levels of resistance and opposition to the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, by 1860, a mere 330 runaway slaves had successfully been returned to their southern masters, despite the law's persistence even after the start of the Civil War. Finally, on June 28, 1864, Congress repealed both federal slave acts from federal penal code, making the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 the final Hail Mary compromise before a nation went to war with itself.
The Middle Passage From the 16th century to the abolition of slavery in America in 1865, some 12 and a half million Africans were torn from their families, homelands, and languages, forced into slavery in a triangular trade route known as the Middle Passage. The first leg of the passage witnessed the imprisonment of Africans after their capture by enemy tribes, before being traded for goods at African slave markets by European and American slave traders. Separated by sex, new slaves were crammed aboard ships known as Guineamen, who hailed mainly from ports in Portugal, Holland, France, England, and America. Packed into the unventilated holds of Guineamen, so tightly that people frequently lacked enough space to sit down or move around, during the approximate 80-day passage to North and South America, some 15% would die from dehydration, starvation, or disease. Those who survived would be sold at auction after their arrival into the Americas, while the proceeds formed the third leg of the Middle Passage when slavers returned home with cargoes full of hides, tobacco, sugar, and rum. Conditions aboard Guineamen were frequently unbearable for slaves and crewmen alike. And while slaves lacked daylight or movement, crewmen were forced to sleep on open decks to maximize the human cargo below. Most crewmen were forced into the slave trade by dishonest barkeeps in collusion with slavers, who fed them vast amounts of alcohol, and when a given prospect drank beyond his ability to pay, their only choice was to sign on to Guineamen for impossibly low wages, taking the lives of an estimated 20% of crewmen during the 246-year history of slavery in North America. Profit-driven slave traders enjoyed reduced payouts due to crew fatalities, while many of those who survived the return trip to Europe or America were frequently cheated out of wages altogether. Crewmen frequently raped female slaves below deck, while many slaves resisted their imprisonment through hunger strikes or suicide jumps from Guineamen decks. Over the centuries, many African tribesmen, such as the crew, developed a reputation of proud resistance to the prospect of enslavement, leading to mass suicides that severely impacted a slave trader's bottom line. The number of deaths caused by suicide or hunger strikes has been estimated at two million lives, while those who died during forced marches to African slave markets and brutal voyages to the New World took the lives of an estimated two million more making slavery in the Middle Passage one of the worst inhumanities in the history of man. The Missouri Compromise In a young nation already deeply divided over the issue of slavery, when the Missouri Territory first applied for statehood in 1818, the desire by many in the territory to own slaves made it the first state west of the Mississippi River to consider slavery, upsetting an already teetering balance between slave and free states in Congress. During the contentious debate on Capitol Hill, New York Representative James Talmadge proposed an amendment to Missouri's statehood bill that would eventually end slavery in Missouri, which passed in the House of Representatives due to an anti-slavery majority while the balanced numbers of pro- and anti-slavery legislators in the Senate refused to pass the bill. When the Missouri bill returned to the House for revision, congressional representatives refused to grant Missouri statehood without the Talmadge Amendment. When Missouri again sought statehood in late 1819, Speaker of the House Henry Clay proposed a compromise that allowed slavery in Missouri at the same time admitting Maine as a free state. To further entice anti-slavery legislators in Congress, in February of 1820, the Senate added a second compromise to Missouri's statehood bill, which upheld slavery in Missouri while outlawing the practice in all lands acquired by the Louisiana Purchase north of Missouri's southernmost border. Signed into law by President James Monroe on March 6, 1820, former President Thomas Jefferson wrote in a letter to a friend that the Missouri question 
like a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I considered it at once as the knell of the Union. It is hushed indeed for the moment, but this is a reprieve only, not a final sentence. While the Missouri Compromise managed to keep the peace for the next 30 years, as westward expansion continued to accelerate, when California petitioned for statehood in 1850, the Compromise of 1850 admitted California as a free state while sending one pro-slavery senator to Washington to maintain the balance of power. Four years later, during the organization of the Kansas and Nebraska territories, the Kansas-Nebraska Act spearheaded by Illinois Senator Stephen Douglas introduced the principle of popular sovereignty, which mandated that each new state should decide the issue of slavery on their own, sparking violence between pro- and anti-slavery settlers now known as Bleeding Kansas, which also led to the formation of the Republican Party and the rise of a formerly unknown lawyer named Abraham Lincoln, making the Missouri Compromise an early tourniquet on the issue of slavery as a nation crept ever closer towards civil war. Today in the Daily Dose, the Second Middle Passage. According to the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database, maintained by professors David Eltis and David Richardson, during slavery's 246-year reign in the Americas and the Caribbean, an estimated 12.5 million Africans were forcibly sold out of Africa, taking the lives of some 2 million men, women, and children during the Middle Passage alone. Justified by religious leaders as the will of God, as well as by so-called scientists who maintain that black people were a lesser evolved subspecies of the human race. Of the 10.5 million Africans who survived the brutal Middle Passage, only 388,000 made their way into North America. After the slave trade was banned in 1808, when Southern economies shifted between 1830 to the start of the Civil War, an internal or domestic slave trade saw the transfer of some one million slaves from the Upper South to the Lower South in what became known as the Second Middle Passage. Following Eli Whitney's invention of the cotton gin in 1794, a Southern slave's ability to clean cotton rose from five to six pounds a day to over a thousand, increasing cotton production from one and a half million pounds in 1790 to 331 million pounds in 1830 and a staggering 2.3 million pounds by the eve of the Civil War. Cotton became king in the lower southern states, triggering a second forced migration of Native Americans out of the newly minted states of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana to the Indian Territory in present-day Oklahoma. As tobacco profits began to erode in the upper southern states of Maryland, Kentucky, and the Carolinas, tobacco planters were obliged to sell their slaves to the cotton kings, increasing the price of slaves from $500 in 1800 to $1800 by the start of the Civil War, or an estimated $64,000 in today's currency. Of the 3.2 million slaves working in the 15 slave states in 1850, 56% worked in cotton, and of the one million sold from the Upper South to the Lower South, many slaves caught up in the Second Middle Passage were sold away from wives, husbands, and children, forced to travel hundreds of miles into the Deep South while frequently shackled and whipped by inhumane slave traders, making the Second Middle Passage yet another worse hard time during the human injustice of slavery in America. And there you have it, the second Middle Passage, today on The Daily Dose. Get your nerd on with The Daily Dose. And if you enjoyed today's episode, share the link with a friend or colleague so that they too can learn something new every day.